Hello friends, welcome to another episode of IC Knowledge Bureau. I'm the convener of Vusi Tembeguayo and today we continue our conversation on one of the broad conversations we've been having specifically around the issue of redress and transformation in South Africa. We're going to drill in today on looking at uh, broad-based black economic empowerment. We'll look at the Act, we'll look at the uh, report that was recently released by the Commission and more importantly we'll have a conversation about what we should be doing as a country to drive this conversation forward. One of the big challenges with having this conversation on broad-based black economic empowerment is how do we remove the myth from the research, what people think from the actual data and what the data tells us. To join us in having this conversation is a person who sits right at the heart of where the action happens and where the research and data is collected. She heads up the Black, uh, black Economic Empowerment Commission, Zot Wantuli. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, and yes. So, <laughs> let's just take a step back. Yes. You and I earlier were having a conversation about how long we've been on this journey. Because I suppose as a black African, I'm getting a, a little bit uh, frustrated. Mm -hmm. 94, we have the elections. Yes. 96, we have the new constitution. In 2003, we promulgate and enact the uh, Black Economic Empowerment Act, mm -hmm. version one. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. We're 15 years in. And when I looked at the research that the commission had done and the report you published, I couldn't believe how little distance we've actually traveled. What are we not getting right? Now, thanks for that question. Um, I, I'm going to take you a step back exactly yeah. from that. Sure, 1994, sure. elections, you know, freedom. Mm. But the question is, what was that freedom? Mm. Politically, yes, we got the freedom. Sure. The Constitution then said to us, these are certain things that you need to do sure. to make the economy more inclusive, yes. to make um, the country um, citizens more equal. Yes. But that did not really happen in the pace that it should have. Right. So in 2003 only, after the constitution was passed in 1996, then you get to pass your first economic redress legislation, which is the Triple B Act. Mm. That was in 2003. So you mm. can imagine you've already lost so much time. And even when that was then done, was passed, the implementation of it was left to the market to determine how it gets to be implemented. <laughs> so from 2003, 2007, in 2007 only, you get your first code of good practice mm. to guide the market in terms of what needs to be done. Mm. So, <laughs> so you're dealing with a, a legacy of over 400 years of mm. apartheid, mm. but you are not moving as quickly as you should mm. in actually bringing into place the redress mechanism. So it took longer to bring the redress mechanism. Mm. So even when we actually got to do it as a country, implementing it again was not really effective. Mm. So if you look, if you recall in 20, I think, um, I think it was in 2013 mm. when parliament reflected and mm. said, mm. is this legislation working? Mm. And they identified a few things that of course the legislation, the intents and objectives are good and well, all right? But we're not implementing it properly then they introduced amendments. But those amendments were seeking to address a few things. One, the sketch of fronting yes, that yes. had happened over from 2003. Yes, yes. Um, then they also wanted to introduce a monitoring mechanism. Yes. How do we even measure that we're getting there? Yes. All right? Because yes. you can't say I'm not getting there if you don't even have a measure. 100%. You don't even have a baseline. Mm. All right? So the third thing was um, consequence for not applying it. Mm. So they introduced penalties. Mm. Criminal, criminalized mm. fronting, mm. criminalized circumvention and all of that. And lastly, introduce a regulator that will then look into now, ensuring that going forward, let's not make the mistakes that we've made in the past of just putting it into the market and hoping, it's Good. like you're throwing a javelin, mm. you know, hoping it gets to a point mm. that you actually want it to get to. Mm. So that was the mistake that we made. And I think the reflection in 2013 was actually a good one. Mm. But the question is, are we going to now do the right thing and do it consistently and mm. do it fast enough? People can't wait. They've been waiting forever. There are so many parts of what you've just said that I, I want to drill into. Yeah. So let's just follow it chronologically. The point you make about, first, how long it took yeah. for us to get the mechanisms right and the mechanization of, of the law right. Why did it take as long as it took? I mean, if we promulgate in 03, yeah. why, why only in 07 are we publishing codes of good practice, one? And two, for the average person watching this, what is a code of good practice? 
Okay, let me, let me explain that first. The code of good practice basically meant that we said this is what we want to achieve, yes. to empower black people economically, yes. Yes. all right? But we didn't say how. Hmm. And how should business do it? Okay. okay. How should government do it? Okay. okay. And so, okay. so, so you, you've got a framework legislation. Mm. You've just said to people, this is what we want to do. Mm. This is what you must do, but mm. not how you must do it. Gotcha. So the codes of good practice are a document that basically says, if we're saying ownership, this is what we expect you to do under ownership. If we're talking management control, this is what we expect you to do the, under that. And how we're going to measure it. Mm. If we're saying that you've actually met the target, it's because the target is this much, I got you. all right. So in the beginning, there wasn't any of that. Mm -hmm. So you've got the legislation from 2003, 2007 only, you do the codes of good practice. Then you're beginning to guide the market. But because there isn't any overseer, the market then become more creative around it, mm. okay? And <laughs> some think they're doing the right thing, but some deliberately get do creative to circumvent, 100%, 100%. all right? So then you find yourself in a situation at, at, at that point when the reflection was taking place in parliament to say, mm -mm, something is wrong here. Mm. So they go back. So that is the situation that we found ourselves in. So we're saying that now that the legislation has been amended, so we had to say, where are we at this point? The legislation has been amended. Mm. Now you've got the regulator. Mm. So the regulator has to sit down and say, what is the problem? What has been the problem? Mm. Because for us to actually know where we should be implementing this towards, we need to know what went wrong so that we don't repeat the same mistakes, but we can also close the loopholes. Mm. So one of the things that we did as the, as the organization when we were established, mm. the first thing when we did our strategy session mm. was to exactly identify what was happening in the market. Mm. What, wa what is it that we want to eradicate? Mm. What is it that we want to make sure it doesn't exist anymore? Mm. Firstly, fronting is a big, big, big problem. Still it is more, it is becoming more and more sophisticated every day. I will share with you the examples, but for now I'll just tell you what we highlighted. Sure. Fronting is a hindrance, and in fronting there's a whole lot of um, corruption, the elements of corruption in it. Yes. So, and, and also it's just economic crime. <laughs> this is just a crime. Mm. It's illegal, it shouldn't be happening, but it gets to, to be more and more sophisticated. And then the second thing that we also identified was the integrity, the lack of integrity in the verification process. So the verification agencies that issue certificates, Oof. that process of conducting that verification had a lot of gaps, mm. where you find that companies don't even have to subject themselves to a verification process. They can always call and say, That's we right. want a certificate yeah. for, need, yeah. for this year. And it, must and it can this just, level. exactly, yeah. it can just be issued. Mm. So those are the things that were happening and we had to look at that. So if you don't have integrity mm. in the triple B certificate that needs to be presented to various government departments, various businesses, if they can't trust that, who are they supposed to trust? So you need to bring integrity in that process. Mm. So that, that was one thing that was a serious challenge. The verifiers were not properly regulated as well. Mm. So that also you know, um, contributed to the gaps. But thirdly, <laughs> the, the, the most important one, the triple B legislation, its success relies heavily on government implementing it and implementing it effectively and consistently. Mm. What we picked up is that government departments in general were not implementing it consistently. Some did not even know that they were supposed to implement it. So in section 10 of the legislation, it says that for any procurement, for any public private partnerships that you enter into, for any license that government must issue, government must bring in BE requirements. So a company that gets a license in this country must, for instance, have met the triple B requirements. So government was not implementing that. And they were not, where they were implementing it is in little bits and, and, and corners and not consistent. Mm. So then you have a problem there. The last thing that we then identified was that a whole lot of people <coughs> Sorry. that must implement the legislation do not understand it, all right? Some do understand it, hence they are able to, to be creative around <coughs> it. Because <laughs> you've got to understand something to be more creative around yes. it. Yes. So, but a, a large number just did not understand it. And the people that are supposed to benefit from this legislation, those are black people, mm. black women, mm. rural people, mm. young mm. black South Africans, mm. they didn't even know that they've got a benefit out of this legislation. So if you are putting something on the ground, 
to benefit me, but I don't even know about that benefit. How would I take it up? Mm. So you've got that disconnect. So those are the four areas that we identified. So now when we then develop our strategy, the first thing that we had to reflect on was, what is it that we want for this country? Mm. The first thing is that you want, in fact, all of the companies to do the right thing. Right. So for them to do the right thing, what do they need? They need to know what needs to be done. Mm. And we provide guidance, we provide advice for free to every entity, even the big ones, the JSC listed companies. Mm. For now, we're providing that advice for free. So for every initiative that you do, for every transaction that you enter into, you bring it to us, you can bring it on a non-name basis, we'll give you advice on it, and we'll help you to structure it in mm. a way that will achieve what is intended. Mm. So that's basically where we're going. Mm -hmm. But a lot of damage happened in the past, mm -hmm. and we need to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And so there are some transactions that took place. You know, there were large, big deals mm -hmm. that were announced we're and all of that. Polishing business papers. Exactly. Yeah. I must tell you that a lot of those are not worth the paper they're written on. Yeah. I'm, I, I, I'm talking from a perspective of triple B. Mm -hmm. They might achieve other things, mm -hmm. you know, a few cents in somebody's pocket, mm -hmm. but in terms of really bringing ownership in the hands of a black person in this country, no. So you'll see those deals, when 10 years comes, then they unwind the deal. So everything goes back to normal. Mm. So there's no black person that owns the productive assets of this country. Mm. So that brings me now back to the issue about the constitution. When I said in 1996, when the constitution was adopted, the one thing that was recognized is that the owner, ownership patterns of this country are completely Skewed. Not acceptable. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. They're still like that today. Yeah. So we needed to make sure that whatever we're implementing gets to a point where it brings in the balance. Mm. And we have not been doing that mm. in the implementation. So now the regulator, which is the Triple B Commission, is now there to make sure that we measure this. Mm. Hence, we then published this first report. This mm. is the first report which is based on information mm. that comes directly from companies. Mm. The other reports that you've seen before, there would be surveys, there would right, be whatever, yeah, yeah. secondary data. Yeah. This is primary data. So we've used information to test it, to test where we are. So at least going forward, we'll be able to say this is where we were, this is where we're going. Scary stuff. Yeah. So I look at, for instance, in part of your report, you speak about the total number of directors. You looked at 121 entities, JSC entities. Yes. And you looked at a percentage of black versus non-black and directors specifically, and I, I, I don't, 62% of directors continue to be non-black. Yep. This, I mean, we live in a country where 83% of the population is black African. This is black broad, so this includes yeah. Indians and coloreds at only 38%, which is extraordinary. And then I looked even further, mm. the, 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 the black females are in the, de in the decline at these yeah. levels of organizations. What, what is going on here? I mean, are companies, have they not got the message or do they not care? <laughs> okay. Um, I'll tell you that, one, I think we need to have a conversation and a very honest conversation as a country. Mm. Okay to be in a position to understand why this is happening. Yes. All right. Yes. Because what, of, what, what, what we've picked up in our engagement with stakeholders as the commission is that we keep on speaking across each other, mm. but we actually forget what was the real purpose of mm. this legislation. Mm. One, with this legislation, you'll see it mirrors the constitution. We wanted to make sure that the, co the economy becomes more inclusive. Mm. How does it become more inclusive? You need to get black people to participate meaningfully in the economy. Mm. How do they do that? They can only do that if they've got ownership mm. of a pie or a part of the pie you know, in the economy, all right? So that is why you've got ownership, to mm. increase the ownership, to change the ownership patterns in this country, because mm. the ownership pattern cannot remain the way they are. Sure. But then secondly, you want to also, even where black people are not owning, you want them to have the ability to influence the strategic direction of those companies. Mm. So that's where we speak about management mm -hmm. control. Yeah. Yeah. But then also recognizing the fact that a whole lot of black people have been deliberately excluded from acquiring the critical skills that are needed in those. Yeah. You then have the element of skills development where companies are required to pay 6% of their payroll every, every year to develop mm. non-employees and employees. Mm. So that's an opportunity to actually you know, train a whole lot of 
um, graduates Absolutely. that are roaming our road, our streets, and you need to do that. The, 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 the fourth one is the enterprise and supply development. With the enterprise development, critical in that is recognizing that not every black person is able to access a loan in the bank mm. for their business. Mm. So it's actually intended to, to extend access to finance on favorable terms mm. from existing businesses, mm. all right, mm. to then actually support entrepreneurs to get into the industry. Of course, there's a, there's a, an inherent conflict with that. So if I'm in the, in the industry, let's say I'm in the telecoms industry, and I'm supposed to um, develop you, and you're also in the telecoms industry, yes. you may be my competitor. Yes, <laughs> all yes, right. yes. But the triple B legislation actually says, if you develop me, if you develop um, VUSI, as an entrepreneur in the value chain, and you help them to move in throughout the value chain, you actually get to be recognized. Mm. You get points for that. Mm. So that's what enterprise development does. Mm. But what has happened is that people have turned it into, what do you call it? There's facilitators, yeah, it's a middle, pitiful, middle it's a people and, yeah. <laughs> and all of that. <laughs> I wouldn't say nice implement. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they are facilitating yes. these things yes. on behalf of companies. Yes. And they actually get, they don't really say what the purpose of this is. Yes. They then sell it as if it's some charity thingy that companies are doing or that they're doing them a favor. And they don't explain the whole thing. They don't monitor that when they have actually provided that support. Is the entity actually moving into the next step? Because if you were an entrepreneur that is not even in the supply chain, the next step should be for you to be then in the supply, supply chain. chain yes. Then they can then claim then points for you supply for development. supply development. Absolutely. All right. But that chain is not explained. And people have got benefits and opportunities that exist, but they are actually ring-fenced by a few people that know it and they don't expand it. That is why people would then say, but B, it doesn't, doesn't benefit the majority of, this, of the country. It's only a few connected people. Of course, it will be connected people that know the information. So what, as the commission, we are saying is that we need to expand the knowledge, the information about what is there. Let more people actually know what exists so that they can get that benefit. Right. That is another thing. That So the last element is the one around socioeconomic development, which basically says, mm. as an entity, you can do anything mm. as long as whatever you're doing is going to bring a black person that was not in the mainstream economy into the mainstream mm. economy. Mm. That's the main thing. Mm. So now if we go back to exactly what was the purpose, we, were, we will be in a position to say, if we've got 38% black representation on the boards of the JSE listed companies. Mm. Why are we there? Mm. So, but you, you can't look at, it in, in, look at it in isolation. If you go to the employment equity report mm. that has been yes, released, yes, by the it mirrors Labor. that. Absolutely. And the data is different, remember? Because we get compliance reports that are purely based on the B requirements. Oh, yes. They get the reports that are based on employment equity purely. Indeed, indeed. But the information the yeah, yeah. is actually, the results are actually the same. So it tells you that to date, the boardrooms are still dominated by white people mm. and they shouldn't. Mm. Where there are black people, it's only a few black people that get to be circulated mm. around, yeah, that are being recycled. So you problem. find exactly, yeah. in some instances, you find one person mm. that's occupying 10 board positions. Mm. So that's also very counterproductive because mm. you can't have that unless a person is actually left their job, they do nothing else except mm. to sit on the boards. In fact, I would imagine from a corporate governance perspective, you it's just It's completely wrong, it. exactly. Yeah. It's completely wrong. Yeah. So those are some of the reflections. When I said we must have these honest con conversations because sometimes when we say exactly what is wrong, even the black person mm. that is supposed to even know better, they actually don't know that that is wrong. Mm. So if I've got 10 board positions, there's five other black women that need an opportunity, where are they gonna get it? Mm. So we need to be able to mm. also spread that. Mm. Yes, of course, the figures are showing us that not enough board positions are becoming available, mm. but even those that are becoming available, it seems like we've got a whole, whole lot of recycling. Mm. So if you look back last year, you'll see that we had women, I think at Duet, 12%, mm. and this year they seem like they've increased to 18%, mm. but it's because this year's figures did not distinguish between foreign nationals and, 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 and South Africans. Oh, South African yes. Right, right, right. So it's possible that there isn't really a significant movement. But what we have seen over 
time was that even when you find that black women increase, the, the black men will drop. So it, it's just a, mm. you know, so, so you don't have like a, a real change in the composition of boards. And, and, and there is still a big drive towards the non-executive, right? As opposed to exactly. the executive who drives a PNL, who is held accountable on the strategy of the business and reports to shareholders, isn't it? You remember when I said to you that I will explain to you how mm. sophisticated fronting mm. even gets. Mm. So for companies, the more the black person is not involved in the business, the better. Mm. That's the model that consultants, a lot of them, are selling to them that we actually can give you a level two or a level one. You don't have to be bothered. We'll get you black partners that don't get involved and all of that. That's completely against the triple B legislation. The triple B legislation is saying that if I'm going to be whether a 15% shareholder in the company, there must be participation. Hmm. And that participation must be as if I'm actually a manager in the company. Hmm. It likens it to that because what you, what you want, for a black person to just have ownership, passive ownership, it doesn't give us the knowledge to actually run this business. Mm. So even if you were to increase your stake, mm. you, you're not getting the benefit mm. that the whole legislation was intended Which for. Which is a knowledge transfer. Exactly, the knowledge transfer. transfer. So where are you going to get that? Exactly. So now the models that are being sold to companies is that, that is fine, we'll get you VUSI. VUSI is actually extremely busy. As, as long as you give him 15%, he'll be fine. Then you get your 15%, but that opportunity that you got, somebody else that could have given it more value mm. has lost that opportunity mm. because it's with you. Another black person that could have participated, that could have actually made the real impact and in fact participation with a view of acquiring the business itself mm. has lost an opportunity. So opportunity. fronting does happen because of those um, models that are being sold around that now we can, so the less and less participa participation uh, companies want on the, on, the, on the boards, on the business, is actually counter the triple B legislation. That's what fronting is all about. Mm. You've got people that you tick and say, I've got black, black ownership, but then if you even speak to those people, they don't even know what the business is doing. They have no clue that they are shareholders. Some of them, they don't even get invited to just a basic shareholders meeting that happens once a year. Uh, just take me a step back. Yeah. So there is a part of me that has tried to learn how not to jab so much. But there, <laughs> are, there are some things that it seems to me are simply common sense. When I put my signature mm -hmm. next to something, mm -hmm. I am agreeing to the thing about which I'm putting my signature next to. Yeah. So if I'm being made a shareholder in an entity and I sign and I say I'm agreeing, how do I not understand the responsibilities? And I'm not talking about mm. going to the Institute of Directors and doing mm. a course mm. on the director's responsibilities mm. and what it means to be derelict of those duties. Yes. I'm talking about simple basics. Guys, I have signed a piece of paper that says I'm a shareholder. Can you just explain to me what is the strategy? Where are we going? Mm -hmm. Who's going to drive it? Mm -hmm. And how are we going to ensure that we're acting in a manner that is consistent with the law of South Africa? So I suppose what I'm saying is, mm. Indeed, there is a responsibility on the corporates yes. who benefit from this fronting. Yeah. But I also think there is, there is equal responsibility on those who are allowing themselves to front. <laughs> I mean, you, you're putting your name next to this thing. Yeah. For, you know, for exchange of a, a German sedan. I don't get it. Okay. It, it seems to me very short-sighted. It is extremely short-sighted. Um, and what you've explained now is, is what is ideal. Mm that if you are a director in a company, first you know what the responsibilities are, sure. you know what the company does, sure. but that's not what happens mm. in this country. And I think um, particularly because people are taking advantage of the vulnerability of the majority of South Africans. Mm. Um, I'm going to, for now, exclude the people that should know. Mm. All right, A person like yourself, mm. I'm not judging, but mm. if you were a director in a company and you do not know what your responsibilities are, I think there will be no excuse yeah. for you. If you've, if you've done something wrong, the CIPC, which, which deals with you know, the duties of directors, must take you up. Mm. And they must probably even declare you as a delinquent director and remove you. Sure. But I'm talking about the majority of the country, where, one, you've got employees that are actually approached to become directors. And already, the power relations are not You're the same. A lot of these ESOP schemes. Exactly. Yeah. You've got that. Yeah. But even not even through ESOPs. Direct, direct shareholding. shareholding. Direct I've shareholding yeah. Yeah. from just yeah. em employees. Absolutely. So already, even if you could be a knowledgeable person, mm. 
immediately the power relations mm. of me, be, me being an employee mm. and you being my employer mm. already it puts us here. Mm. If you don't invite me to board meetings, I'm even afraid to ask you mm. a question. Mm. So we see a whole lot of that. Mm. So even people that you are wanting to say, they should have asked the question. You know, at, this, at the same time, you also say, but they are a worker. Mm. They could lose their jobs. Mm. Right. They, you, so, there's, so there's that. Right. So I'm saying that there are extremes, but there's no excuse for any black person to take up an ownership position or directorship position without them knowing. I can, I can really understand it for those people that really do not have um, the knowledge about that, mm. but we see that um, increasingly the vulnerability of black people, purely because of the historical background, is taken advantage of. Mm. But also there, I mean, people can't continue to, to plead in you know, ignorance that we didn't know that we we're supposed to do this because they're perpetuating the very same uh, fronting. So that is why when we do our investigations, if you come and allege that you were you fronted, we don't only look at the company, we look at you as well. What was your role? Oh, wow. So we then have an, an instance where we are dealing with what we call willing frontees. <laughs> so if you were a willing participant in the fronting arrangement, then certainly if we are referring anybody for prosecution, you'll be part of it. Hmm. So we're saying that, of course, we'll look at the circumstances. There are people that certainly could not have done anything about it, especially employees, especially communities, because the companies that make community members, shareholders, mm -hmm. the participation is extremely remote. So the company virtually just continues as if nothing has changed. The ownership hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. So they can make a lot of decisions. You don't know about it because you're just a community member mm -hmm. who is either represented through a trustee, mm -hmm. a trustee that, mm -hmm. you know. That may or may not. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, so there are instances where we, we look at it very objectively. Mm -hmm. We look at it, we, we, we consider what the circumstances may have been. But I can tell you that um, I think for the first year of this work, I was traumatized every day. Because every day I get to sit with people that I expect to know better mm. and they actually had no clue mm. that they were in a fronting deal. It was a big deal, it's worth billions. They were told the projections are this way. But then when you get into the detail of the agreement, that was unlikely to be achieved. So you were basically sold something, and because you do not know <laughs> much about that, they, they sold you something. The, pro the financial projections could not have, I mean, for instance, a lot of vendor financing, yeah. they say you'll pay it in five years, but then you don't <laughs> even get a penny in dividend. How are you going to even repay that loan. Yes, because what they do is they control the dividends policy. Exactly. So you paid back in dividends. Exactly. But they then describe the dividends policy. So a whole lot of people got into those those schemes. Mm -hmm. The the contracts are this thick, of course. So, but we expect you to have read it. <laughs> but mm -hmm. we can't say that to everybody and say, but you should have read this. And of course, their We've contracts are written that. and read by big fancy law firms in Santa. Yes. You're so the, again, the, uh, the negotiation, the bargaining power is completely not balanced. There's, 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 a new, there's a building school of thought, and I, I referenced some research by uh, Van de Merwe et al. I think he did it around uh, 2014. Mm -hmm. And the specific research looked at the economics of black economic empowerment and what they sought to prove. Admittedly, there were some issues with their methodology, but what they were mm -hmm. doing was they were trying to, to prove that actually companies that have done black economic empowerment have seen a reversal of fortunes or even a loss of value relative to the market. So here's the question. Should we, mm -hmm. when we're looking at the conversation about black economic empowerment, even be entertaining the conversation about the market value of a business? You see, there's the, the, uh, there are a lot of studies that can actually contradict that. Sure. So, but we're not going to get into that sure. now. But if you, let, let's just take um, other jurisdictions for, for, for an example. Look at the Malaysian economy, yes. where it started and yes. where it got. Yes. Because of a policy that was, in fact, our BE policy is actually based on that right, one. Yeah, yeah. If you look at them, they are working around a um, single digit unemployment figure. Hmm. The last time I checked, they were at 2% unemployment hmm. as a country, moving from two digits, you know, over a period of time. So if you've got a, a, a proper plan, Mm. And, 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 and I mean, anyway, research has also shown that if your economy is more inclusive, 
you're likely to be more competitive, 100%. more productive. Mm. So it can't be that you, you, your value will drop. So there may be other consequences that are not really long term, mm. that could be immediate because of the change in approach, the change in policy, but they're not necessarily going to continue going forward. So what we've seen is that, in fact, the more transformative, the more inclusive, the more um, growth in the economy and the more jobs you can create. Earlier, so, yeah. Earlier you and I had the conversation about, it seems that there was a, a narrative, and I'm not sure who said it, but I think that's just how people have understood it, that black economic empowerment mm -hmm. meant white economic impoverishment. That, that almost the, the more of the one you did, yeah. the more of the other there was. It, and, and I'm not sure where that comes from. I, I also, by the way, before asking you this question, mm -hmm. I must tell you that I hesitate to ask it because at a personal level, I don't believe black people bear the burden mm -hmm. of making white people feel comfortable about anything, right? Yeah. That, that said, what, is, what would be, imagine that I am the middle-aged white male Mm -hmm. who sits in, at middle management in a large corporate, because that's where the action happens. Yeah. I'm the middle-aged white male, yeah. 50s. Mm. I've been in this organization for 30 years, single degreed, and I drive a PL and I make decisions about procurement, about who to hire, who to fire, who to promote, mm. about who to send on training courses. I am that guy. And every time I hear this thing, BEE, the, the, the one thing that happens in my head is all I see is I'm out of a job, because I'm a white male how mm. should i be approaching this conversation what should be my demeanor my energy my disposition look um i think we must start from a you know as a business part of your strategy must embrace the laws of the country yes. that's the first thing yes so now if your strategy as a business mm. is the one that says this is how I'm going to drive my procurement. This is how I'm going to drive inclusivity. This is how I'm going to drive, you know, my board representation. And it's because you are a good corporate citizen. Mm. You want to comply with the laws of the country. Mm. Then there shouldn't be any, um, what can I say, any misconception about what Triple B is all about. Mm. So, so again, we go back to the basic. What is the purpose of this legislation? And I think that then takes us back to a consistent message around triple BE mm. is very important. Mm. We need to know exactly what the purpose of it is so that we are able to drive towards the same direction. I hate to interject. Yeah. This is the third time you use that word, a consistent message. What do you mean by that? What I mean is, you know, if, if, if we speak on a policy in different ways mm. that are actually even contradictory, mm. you make it very difficult for the person that is supposed to implement it to actually embrace it right. because your messaging is completely wrong. Mm -hmm. So what we're saying is that the messaging must be found in the legislation itself and it must be found in the intention of the legislation, which is there in the objectives of the act. Mm -hmm. In section two, it tells you exactly what is it that we're seeking to achieve. Mm -hmm. So if that is the message and everybody who embraces our constitution, whether black or white South African, mm -hmm. if they embrace our constitution, they will understand why we need to do that. And if you are, again, a good corporate citizen, then you should be able to have it in your strategy, as part of your strategy. Mm. Not a tick box exercise that sometimes people do. They appoint just a one black person <laughs> in the organization. They say, you deal with BEE. Mm. All we want, <laughs> we want a certificate. Head of transformation. Yes, we want, exactly. Yeah. We just want a certificate that says no level below two. All right? That's the mandate that you have. <laughs> that, that can be. So strategically, you're completely wrong. But I do think, um, it was just to agree with you that um, we should not create excuses for implementation of triple B. Sure, sure. And at the same time, again, the debates that are coming, you know, from various direction, they're actually normal, but they should not detract from what is intended. Mm. I think what we need to do is to go back to facts, mm. all right? Mm. Like we said, we are measuring now facts. Based on our reports, this is what the country is at this is what that, this is what we look like so how do we what do we do then to make sure that we move from that the 18 percent representation of females when actually females are in the majority in this country yeah, it's, it's completely yeah, out, it's of, out of order yeah. so we need to say what are the plans then the various entities in the private sector in government they must then say 
we then lift our targets to this. So if this year you actually just wanted 20% black ownership, next year it means that up the game. So your target must be upped. So you need to do that progressively so that ultimately we get to a point where we can, re we can achieve the, the I equality. Am, now I want to change my complexion a bit. I am the common person of color. I'm a common yeah. black person. Yeah. I'm employed in a company. Yes. Um, and I want to give you two scenarios. I'm employed in a company. I'm not in management at all. Okay. What are my rights and responsibilities as it pertains to this conversation of BEE? One, I think if you're not in management, so you're not in control of the policies, but you are still a citizen and you are an employee in the organization. Can I ask? The one thing that you need to be able to know is that you are entitled to being trained, mm. to being developed, mm. you know. Um, not only on things that have got to do with the work mm, here mm, mm. in your position. That's what the skills development element says. It says it's actually training over and above your normal 1.5% yeah, yeah, yeah. payroll yeah. of companies. So in addition to your normal training in the organization, this says you must actually give me more skills for me to actually move higher, mm. either higher in the organization or higher Elsewhere. elsewhere sure. All right. So that's basically what it means. Mm. So, and, and, and again, we're not looking only in South Africa. If it means that you're giving the skills that are going to make me even marketable outside this country, then good shot, you see. Mm. So if you're an employee that's not in management, that has got no control over the policies, you just need to know what is it that you're entitled to. Mm. And ask questions mm. and request, ask for a plan to say, I need to be developed. This is the areas that I mm. think I need to be developed in. Be proactive. And I think that is the part when I said that a number of people that are beneficiaries or are supposed to be beneficiaries under the Triple B legislation do not even know mm. that they are beneficiaries. And as a result, they're not able to even ask that question. Mm. If I am a black entrepreneur, can I walk into a company tomorrow and say, please give me your enterprise development plan? I will turn it this way. I think you must do a value proposition. Okay and present it to a company and say, this is me, Vusi, this is yes. what I do. Yes. I would like to see myself here. Is your enterprise development program able to help me with mm. this? Mm. For me, I think that will work because you're creating a relationship. A con a conversation. Yes, a you are creating a relationship of you moving with this company, helping you. So it's not a matter of demand. It's a matter of knowing what is it that the legislation allows for, mm. because the triple B legislation is more an enabler, mm. right? It mm. enables you to mm. do certain things, but you must know what is it that it enables you to do. So if you approach a company and you're asking them, this is me, and then if they, their program will not be able to cater for you, they'll tell you and they'll give you reasons, mm. and then you'll move to another one. And to you know? those of us, and I say us because I include myself in this, who have the responsibility and privilege of sitting in those boardrooms, who are board members, yes. who are shareholders, what is our responsibility as it pertains to fixing the status quo? I'm looking at a decline of women in agri-BEE, yes. in forestry, in yes. construction, yeah. in tourism, in ICT. I mean, this is, it's extraordinary to say the least. One, not only that it's a decline, but that mm. it's a decline of such a low base. Yeah. You're doing worse than bad. It's extraordinary. Yeah. So for those of us who are sitting in those boardrooms and have a voice, yeah. what should we be thinking and saying? Look, I, I, I do think that um, when you are on a board, you're even more strategically positioned mm. to make sure that the triple B E legislation, mm. but not only that, but all the transformational legislation, mm. like your employment equity, they find a place in the strategy of the mm. company because mm. your job is to oversee yeah. the company from a strategic point of view. Yeah. So often they say that if you're a board member, of course, your hands must not be too much in there, um, you must, but your ear must be there. <laughs> so certainly you need to make sure that um, you, you've got part of your strategy involves what is it that you're going to be doing in the short term and in the long term around triple B. So for me, I do think that you, you do have a role to, to play in that. But I think what we are finding is that, like I indicated earlier, a whole lot of um, black executives or non-executive directors, sometimes they find it difficult to, to have that conversation in the boardroom because the, the environment has not been enabling. Yeah. 
But what we've said as the commission is that now that there's a regulator, remember that even where you feel previously that you were unable to, to, to voice your, 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 your views in a board or in a, in a management meeting or whatever, we are there to help facilitate that. So if you find that it's very difficult in your board, you can tell us. We will then organize a session for your board. Mm. We will then go through and have that conversation with your board so that going forward, it's not only your debate, it's not only your view, but it's actually a view that is appreciated by everybody. Mm. So in as much as we are a regulator, but I do believe that our job is also to, to give a voice to those that were a bit voiceless because they were afraid of intimidation. Mm. If you bring it through us, we are able to do it for you. Um, in not in an investigation in an investigation manner, but in a manner that says to a company, we would like to 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 to, to speak to your board regarding one, two, three. Final question. Yeah. So, as 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 the commission, what is your plan to ensure that in twenty years we're not having this kind of conversation again? And secondly, what is your hope for how South Africans will take to? the spirit of the legislation? Okay, the first thing that I should say is that, you know, um, last week, you know, when we released the report, the, then coincidentally there was a whole lot of debate around BE, whether it's working or it's not working. The first thing that I really <laughs> wish we could have is, because if we're going to be very honest, we're going to have to approach things in a very honest manner yes. as well to be able to measure whether there's any success or no success. I wish the real beneficiaries of BE can stand up and say, I did benefit, so that we can then be in a position to say, oops, so if this legislation could take you from here to there, then it means this is where we need to take you. Absolutely. You know, for me, that will really help the country to have a, a much more honest conversation, but also help us as the regulator to see and, and be able to integrate when we do our own studies and research, we're able to integrate that kind of, 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 of feedback that comes from the real beneficiaries. Mm -hmm. Because from 2003, I promise you there's a whole lot of people that have benefited, mm -hmm. but not enough mm -hmm. because the majority has not benefited. So yes, you've got a number of people that benefited, but it's not the majority. But, but I take your Second, point that say yeah. not enough is not is different to no one at all. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I when think that's the point that I want to make. Working, yes. What you're saying is nobody's benefiting. Exactly. Yeah. So we, we want to the, the second thing that I also wanted to say is that again, we need to also move away from a conversation that wants to take black people to a point where they are viewed as like serial beneficiaries of grants like income beneficiaries as opposed to real participants <laughs> in the economy, <laughs> all right? So, so the conversation that was taking place last week for me was actually bordering on something like that, that we actually are not looking at what exactly was the intention of this legislation. So income beneficiaries are not necessarily empowerment initiatives. Mm. You're just putting money in somebody's pocket so that they can buy food today but they're gonna need that money again. So you cannot reduce black people to that. You need to empower them so that they're able to do it themselves, mm -hmm. so that they can own the productive assets of this country. But as the commission, what we did, um, as I indicated to you, that we looked at what was the problem. And of course, every year we look at that and see if we are, these, are, these are still relevant. So we then adopted a compliance strategy and a corrective enforcement strategy. All right. All right. Okay. So now our end compliance strategy looks at being open to every entity in this country, whether big or small. If you want to do anything on BEE, talk to us. Mm -hmm. We'll help you from A to the end. Mm -hmm. We'll have time for you. Mm -hmm. So that what we're trying to avoid is that 10 years down the line, we don't want those deals that are mm -hmm. winding up mm -hmm. with no Mm. ownership in the hands of black people. Mm. So we want to prevent it now so that we don't have that situation because the 2003 situation created a fallacy mm. that there was empowerment of mm. BEE. But when the deals are winding up, there is no ownership, so it reverts. So now when we see the, the figures regressing here, we're asking ourselves, why are we regressing? If it was never a real ownership deal, it, it, it can't, yeah. it can't be, no, all right, because there's point. not going to be that. So we've seen, we, in, the, in the studies, the studies are showing us that from 32%, we have, we've now regressed on ownership to, mm. 20, to 27%, mm. all right? So that's not good. That's not good. So now our, um, our um, compliance strategy is going to assist the country to then go 
step by step, making sure that whatever we do now is perfect and that it's implemented properly going forward. So that is targeting all companies, private sector, but also largely government. Mm. Government, you'll see from our report that from government departments, we did not even receive a single report submitted last year. It's only this year that is coming up. So we are not even able to measure you can't properly measure, yeah, you don't whether government, case. exactly, whether government is doing what government is supposed to be doing. We only received about four from state-owned entities. So again, we are not able to measure, and those account for a big it's the largest procurement. Of goods in the country, exactly. Absolutely. So if we cannot have the data for that, so how do you actually measure impact? So you only measure it from the JSE listed companies. So we are saying that if we now roll out our compliance strategy, which we are doing, and in fact, we started it last year, we started with it from the beginning, the compliance strategy. What is interesting is that, in fact, our compliance requests are increasing more than the complaints. So, and this is what we wanted to achieve. If we're doing it right, then we should have more people approaching us directly so that we can help them yeah. than people fronting others so that you know so so we don't want more people coming to us and say i've been fronted absolutely however our corrective enforcement strategy basically what it says is that if you come to us earlier we help you and you make a mistake in the implementation we can at least be a bit lenient on you mm -hmm. and help you to correct it all right mm -hmm. but there will be a little bit of punishment because now you're in the corrective side of things but we'll give you an opportunity to correct it but where we find blatant criminality of pure fronting will refer you for criminal prosecution. So there, there will be no excuse. Mm. So now, that is where we are thinking, those are the gaps. That is why we'll see that when we started doing our investigations, more of our proactive investigations are in relation to what? The verification mm. in industry. Mm. And then secondly, <laughs> um, the broad-based schemes. Mm. All right. I see some of those yes. agencies have been quarantined as well. Yeah. <laughs> so so we, we've got that. So, so, so our strategy really, we're hoping that if we do the right thing from a compliance side of things and companies do implement these deals properly, we should then prevent situations where we're going to get a lot of people saying that, no, but this was not a real big yeah. deal. All yeah. right. Yeah. But we do not have like a, what can I say, we, there's, there's no silver bullet. Mm. All right. Mm. But government is going to have to increase how it actually performs on its side. Mm. So it is a, it's a, it's a big, it's a, it's a huge lever so we for need being. Increased government participation, yes. involvement in the drive. Yes. We need better co coordination, cooperation. Yes. Um, from private sector. Yes. And, and then and we need a citizenry that is informed about what is the, what is the legislation, what are their rights, what are their responsibilities. Yes. So yes. let me just say again, yeah. just in conclusion, that yeah. also when we're now looking at this B initiatives, yeah. Our focus as the Commission is we look at the quality of that initiative right. and the sustainability thereof. So it's no longer about the, the, the deal and then, then we shake hands, then they cut ribbon and everybody's happy they say there's a BE deal. No, no, no. When we look into it as the Commission, we look at the quality of it and whether it's going to be sustainable mm. and also whether it's going to make the impact. Mm. So if it's not going to bring that ownership in the hands of black people, transfer of ownership, then it's not the real BE deal. Mm. So we're saying that if we can do it the right way, then certainly I don't think we'll have this conversation 20 years down the line. Yeah. Certainly not. But we're going to have to throw a few people in jail, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Just to send the message that, you know, where there's blatant criminality, it can be, it can be tolerated, sure. yeah. And, and fronting is a crime, actually. Sure. Thank you so much for joining us, Soto. Thank you. We really appreciate it. And guess Zulubati and as you get a sense, we have a long way to go. Just a few closing comments from me. First, you have a responsibility to know what your rights and responsibilities are. You need to know what the act says, but more importantly, get involved. Get involved in the organization you work, the community you live, the spaces where, that you occupy. Make sure that you have the information, the knowledge, the power, the tools that you require to be a person of impact. But if all else fails, the commission is available. You get a hold of the commission and they will help you to get a better sense of your situation and where you are at. Ultimately, the project about black economic empowerment is not about the enrichment of a few. It is about lifting the status of the whole country so people who were systematically, systematically disenfranchised and disempowered can become part of a system of inclusion. And mm -hmm. until we get that right, Project South Africa is not sustainable. 
Thank you so much for joining us on another episode of IC Knowledge Bureau.